Um, I greet you all, every one of you, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, it, is, <clears throat> it is a great privilege uh, uh, for me to be standing um, in front of you, uh, to be used by God to share a message um, which I personally feel that uh, it is a very important message, especially for our time. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so I, I feel that today's um, message is a very important message, especially to me. Uh, and um, I'm sorry to say this, this, this should take like an hour. So now we have got um, Cora too. So I ask that you will be patient with me because it should be. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So, um, so when you look at, um, when you look at the, uh, the image that is uh, on your screen there, you see that um, as, as Adventists, we have what we call the seven pillars of our faith. And um, the founders of the faith, through prayer, Bible study, um, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you find that our faith has been shaped through prayer, and when you look at those fundamental principles that shape our faith, like the health message, the state of the dead, this spiritual prophecy, the law of God, the victory over sin, righteousness by faith, I personally feel that there is one truth which unfortunately um, is not being talked about much often, that is the message of the sanctuary. Uh, it is said to mention that um, some we have chosen to ignore it for some reason. But I feel that the biblical truth that Jesus is our great high priest interceding in heaven for our sins, it is the truth that shaped our early experience of the Adventist believers. And these ancient um, biblical sanctuary and its services, they do reveal profound lessons for us today. And I, I, I would love to call them myself God's um, laundry system. So today's message uh, is, is entitled God's laundry system. And I, 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 I would want to say that God has got a, a system which is more like our laundry at home, where the ultimate goal is to cleanse us from all our, from all our sins. But one might ask a question to say, why? Why was the sanctuary in the first place? Where did this come from? How did it come about? So you find that in the beginning, it all began in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. You, when you get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, I like it very much because you will see that in the beginning, God had a relationship with men. There was that bond. There was that communication every day. And the writer... Um, by the inspiration of God, he's told that God, in the cool of the day, the Lord God would walk and have communion with men. So he found that there was a relationship between God and men which was so close. But then what happened? You find that in the, in, in, in the very same garden, there was found a serpent. And through the uh, space of time, Eve listened to the voice of the serpent, and she ate the forbidden fruit. And she went and gave it to Adam, and Adam ate also of the forbidden fruit. So what, what did God do? God had to do something. God sent, sent them away, both of them, out of the Garden of Eden. Why do you think God had to send them away? There must be a reason. Remember, mankind and God have always been in a good, perfect relationship. But there was a time when God had to send mankind out of the, Id, out of the garden. Why? Because Isaiah tells us, 59 verse 2, that your sins, our sins, the sins of mankind, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, it separated that relationship. So the writer says, your sins have separated between you and your God and your sins your sins have hid his face from you and that he will not hear. So when Adam and Eve sinned, 
There was that separation because of sin. That communication which God has, has always longed for was separated. So now, what was the solution? God had to do something. We know that in John chapter 3, verse 1, even though men had sinned, even though there was that separation, God still loved who? Sinners. You know, he had sin, but he still loved sinners. So God being God, he, had, he made an initiation. He, he, he says, behold, what manner of love the Father has shown to us that we should all become the children, sons and, and daughters of God. And because of that love, what did God do? Because he loved us. He wanted us to come back to him. Because of that love, he told Moses, he said, make me a what? Make me a sanctuary that I might, I might what? I might dwell amongst you. That's what God said. Meaning to what? Make me a place that I can come again to be closer to you. Because that has always been God's purpose, to be closer to us. So the sanctuary was built up long back in the beginning. That was the foundation of the, of the sanctuary. Because God, he wanted to, to come back to have that relationship with mankind. The psalmist also is on to say, no wonder David had to say, he, he, he was revealed that truth and he said, thy way, thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. When you think of, of, of this statement, you might think, but how come, what came to his mind to say, God's way is in the sanctuary? He says, thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Now, so God gave to Moses a blueprint for the building. He, he gave him specifications. He, he, he gave him the, the type of material, uh, the type of metals, the type of colors, the, the type of skins to use. He gave him the dimensions of each and every particle which was supposed to be in the sanctuary. And he gave him a blueprint for building the sanctuary. And then he said, make me this sanctuary. And after, in this Sanctuary will be a pattern, a pattern, mark the, the, those words, of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments used in all the services. Because God had, a, had special plans for the sanctuary, just, be, just besides being able to be with, with his people, God wants, or he wanted everyone to know how much he loves them. And the best way to show us how much he loves us is found in the sanctuary. So there is no way that we can, we can have a foundation of our faith without the sanctuary message. So God has always wanted everyone, of us to, all of us to know how much he loves us. And the best way that he shows us is, is in the sanctuary. Now, what was the significance of the biblical sanctuary? So you find that for thousands of years, the sanctuary and its services they were a focus, the main focus for the Israelites people. And, and, and right after they had moved out from Egypt, God told Moses, as we have seen in Exodus chapter 25, to make him a sanctuary. And, and you find that the services for the sanctuary, they were done mornings and evenings to, to make sure that when everyone, when anyone sins, there is an opportunity in the morning and there's also an opportunity in the evening. And you also find that when you read Leviticus that the sanctuary was the center of all the feasts that these people had. And everyone was invited to come and offer sacrifices for their sins. So this sanctuary was the church in the desert during their journey from Egypt to Canaan. The sanctuary was the church. God had a very specific plan. And he says, in, in Exodus 29, verse 9, it says, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its finishing, just, just so you shall make it. Once they had settled down, they built a permanent structure. We know that King Solomon uh, built the first stately temple uh, when he said in, in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 5, he says, I propose to build a, a house for the name of of the Lord. So what did the earthly sanctuary look like? What did it look like? I'm sure that picture is hazy, but I'm sure you can see a little bit about 
So we want to find out what did the earthly sanctuary look like? And also, that can help us to answer a question. Is there a sanctuary in heaven? Because that is the main question today. That is debate. Is there a sanctuary in, in heaven? Does the Bible have, does the Bible itself alone, can, can it give us answers? Um, and what does the heavenly sanctuary look like? When you go to Hebrews chapter 8, chapter 9, but because of time, when you read those two chapters from, from, from verse 1, you find that, that this sanctuary in heaven, this, there is a sanctuary in earth, which, in, in heaven, which the Lord himself pitched and, and not men. And we are told in Exodus chapter 8, verse 2, that the sanctuary that these people were told to build, it was a copy and it was a what? A shadow of the heavenly things. Meaning that whatever Moses was told to build, it was a copy of exactly how things are in heaven. When you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, you find that it was this sanctuary on earth, it was modeled after the heavenly sanctuary. So now, when you, let's take a tour of this sanctuary. Let's take a tour. When you reach in the sanctuary, according to that picture, you see that there is a gate you'd, you, you'd walk through with your animal, a lamp without blemish, and there is a gate. And that gate, that's where you enter there. And when you enter into that gate, you meet a priest. You, and, and, and when you meet a priest there, that's when, when you behave in your animal and you confess your sins to that animal. It used to be, it, it was mainly uh, a lamp without blemish. And you, when you confess your sins, um, uh, uh, on, or your sins would be transferred straight to what? To the animal. Now, what did the gate represent? Is there a message uh, in this one? So Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 7, he says, I am the door of the sheep. So you'd find that when David said, thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary, there was a meaning. When you look closely at each and every particle, each and every common component of the, of the sanctuary, it pointed to someone who was Jesus Christ. Because he says, I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 7. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, Jesus' ministry, it offers us the right way of living. That is the right way. That is what we get from, from, from the gate. When you enter through the gate, what, where do you go to? You are in the courtyard. And in the courtyard, the first thing that you will see there is the altar of bent offering. Now, the altar of bent, bent offerings, that is the place where you bring your lamp and you will sacrifice on it. John chapter 1, verse 29, what, the, what does it say? It says, Behold, I am the lamp of God who takes away the sins of the, God, the, sins of the world. You find that when you, after you, 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 you have, um, um, trans, after your sins have been transferred to the, to the animal, um, I mean to the animal. That animal was the one which was now put on the sacrifice and it was burnt. And you see that there was flame. That flame also, when you read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says, Our God is a consuming fire. Friends, in Christ's redeeming ministry, Christ himself is now the lamp and he offers his blood for our forgiveness and cleansing. Again, when you go further, when you look further, when you're still in the courtyard, you, you will see a basin. And this water, uh, there was water which was always in this lava of basin. And it was a huge basin, actually. And it was used for cleansing and purifying of what? Of the priest. And throughout the Bible, we know that water is a symbol of what? Life and for purity. Jesus offers a fountain of living water. In, he, he says in John chapter 4, verse 14, he says, I am the fountain of 
of water springing up into everlasting life. And he promises us as well that he who believes in him shall never thirst. Jesus' ministry in the sanctuary offers us healing. It offers us hope through the waters of baptism. Now, when you go further, there you find that you reach a place which is called the holy place. And in the holy place, when you look there, you find that there are three components in the holy place. Number one is the table of showbread. Number two, the altar of incense. Number three, the seven golden candlesticks. And in the holy place, so, so, <clears throat> so on, the, on the table of showbread, there, were, there was always two, um, 12 loaves of bread, six on this side, six on this other side. And these loaves of bread, take note, they, were, they, would, they would make sure that they are always what? Fresh. Every Sabbath, these loaves of bread, they needed to be, to be what? To be put, to be, I mean, to be changed. Likewise, what, what does Jesus say? He says, I am the what? The bread of life. And he says, men shall not live on bread alone. Even, even today, how does this apply to, 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 to us? Christ's ministry in the sanctuary, it gives us the bread of life through his word every day. No wonder even us, every day we need to be, to be reading our Bible, to be well, well, to, to be well acquainted before we go to work, when we are about to sleep, in everything that we do. Again, in the sanctuary, in the holy place, there was the seven golden um, candlesticks. And these candlesticks, we are told that they were always filled with oil for burning. So these candlesticks, they were always burning. And what does Jesus say? He says, I am, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. And he says, let your light so shine before men that they might see what? Your good works and promise and what glorify God in heaven. Jesus' light can shine through us, friends. He is the light. Now, you will see again on that same candlestick, there was oil which was always put, put there. And we know that oil, when you read Zechariah chapter 4, verse 12, uh, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Today, in this, in, in this antitypical day of atonement, one thing that we should be praying for daily is the, what? the outpouring of what? The Holy Spirit. We know in Joy chapter 2, what does it say? We know it by heart. Elder Mtando, what does it say? Joy chapter 2. Elder David, in the last day, God shall pour out your spirit upon and young men shall Dream, dreams. So you find that this is the time that we, 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 we need to be looking, we need to be praying for the Holy Spirit because he is our faithful guide. Now you will see that in the holy place again, there was what to call an altar of incense. This was closer to the veil which separated um, the, the outer court from the, more, for, 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 which separated from the holy place and from the um, most holy place. So on this altar, incense was burned on this altar. And this incense, uh, it filled the whole sanctuary with what? With, fragr with fragrance. Psalms chapter 141, verse, verse 2, it says, let your prayers be set, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Friends, as our prayers rise up to heaven. What does Jesus do? He hears them and he relays them. He intercedes for us to the Father. We get that from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Jesus hears our prayers and he's interceding for us today. That is the truth that we find in the sanctuary today. Now, when you go further now, you enter into a place through where the, only the high priest was found. It was called the most, most holy place. And in the most holy place, there was a structure, some which looked like this. There is a structure which looks like this. And unfortunately, you cannot see some of the words there. But you would find that uh, the first thing 
there are several things that you see there. One of them is the mercy city there. Now, on top of the altar itself, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, between the two cherubims, there was the mercy city. And that was the place where God's presence would come. And, and in Exodus chapter 25, God told the Israelites that, and there I will meet you. And, in, and, and, and then he said, I will speak to you from above the mercy city. Just, just inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was also a port, and that port was the golden port of manna. Remember when God, uh, when the Israelites cried for food, what did God do? He sent what? He rained manna from heaven. And, and this was a reminder that God would always take care of us when our situations seem impossible. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, friends, what does it say? It says, my God shall supply all, all our needs according to his riches. What was the other thing that was found inside um, this Ark of the Covenant? There was Aaron's rod, and this Aaron's rod, according to Numbers, it was a rod <clears throat> which would bud. And, and we are told that... <clears throat> Can you get me some water? Water. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we are told that uh, <clears throat> in Numbers chapter 17, verse 8 to 10... Um, when the children of Israel, there was a time when, when they questioned who was on their side. And, and we see that each one, <clears throat> each one of the leaders of Israel was told to take a staff and to put it in the what? Inside the ark. And Aaron's rod budded. And this one, it reminded them that God is always on their side. God was always <clears throat> there to guide them. The psalmist in Psalms chapter 118, verse 6, he says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can men do unto me? Again, when you see inside the, the, the ark, there were two tablets of stones which were put inside the ark. And Christ, in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Christ is, <clears throat> Christ is the end of the law. Christ is... So in the commandments, we know that that's where God leads us. And further on, when you look further on inside the ark, just like we said, in the middle of the ark between the two cherubims, according to that um, you know, photo which I, which, I, which I took, Exodus 25, verse 22, the Lord would come and speak to the, to the children of Israel above the mercy city. So the Shekinah glory, it represented the what? The presence of the Father. We, we also have the pillar of cloud. I'm just running fast because of time. The pillar of cloud which would represent the presence of what? Of God the Son. Remember when the children of Israel were on their journey, there was a what? A cloud by day and a what? A pillar of fire by night. Friends, in the sanctuary, we see the presence of, of God the Son, God the Father. <clears throat> and also, we also see, we have got other representation. That is more like a pictorial view of how the sanctuary outside wa was. We, there were some skins, there were some pillars which were uh, made of gold. And we want to see the veil between uh, the two most holy places and the uh, the holy place. Remember when Jesus was dying, what happened to the veil? Uh, in, in, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus died and he said, it is finished, the veil between the holy place and the most holy place, it was twain into, into two, meaning that all the sacrifices that were being done, uh, they were no longer uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 going to continue be, be, because type because Jesus was a type of, 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 of all this thing. Type had made what? Anti-type. And when you look further, there were metals which were in the tabernacle and three metals to take note of when you read uh, Exodus 25, verse 3, when you go back home and read 
Exodus 25, verse 3, there was brass. There was also gold. There was silver. And all of these metals, they had a message because his way is in the sanctuary. Brass, when you look at brass, for those who did chemistry, brass is a what? It's a combination of what? Uh, teacher, chemistry teacher. Huh? Who is, who is it? Yeah? Copper. Copper and zinc. Brass. So, so brass, um, brass is a combination of metals. Okay? It's a combination of two metals. You go and find out which ones. But it's a combination of two metals. So, so now, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> even when Jesus came to on, on earth, he was 100% what? You mean in yours, was 100% what? Divine. Being in the form of God, he considered himself not being like God. Gold, why was gold used there? It was for a reason. When you look at the trials that Jesus went through on earth, the, the, Jesus, as Hebrews um, says, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, he was made perfect through suffering. That's why gold is used. Silver as well, that's our desire for Jesus. And when you look at this photo, uh, you will find that there were so many colors uh, which were there, blue, blue, purple, red, white, scarlet, black. And you find that all this God being a God of order, and he wanted us to understand how much he loves us. And the message which, is, which the sanctuary um, hears for us when you look at blue, blue in prophecy represents what? The law of God, obedience to the law. Numbers chapter 15, verse 38. Purple. You remember when, when, when the soldiers were mocking Jesus, what did, what did they do? They took a what? A purple robe and they put on him. So purple represents royalty. Red represents the blood of, of Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 12. White represents what? The righteousness of Christ. The righteousness that Christ creates to us. us. When you confess our sins, Christ takes our sins and he gives us the what? His righteousness. Scarlet, it means what? Sin. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says what? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So even today, through the sanctuary message, through this color, we can see that Christ is saying today, though our sins are as, as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. When you look at the shape of how this sanctuary was made, it was more like a, a cross, more like a cross where you had to go through a gate, you, 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 you go to the ark of sacrifice, the lava of basin. On this side, you see the table of shoebread. On this side, you see the seven golden candlestick. And further, a, a little bit, that's when you meet the altar of incense. It was more like a representation of the cross of Christ because Jesus is trying to, to tell us today that if, if any man, any woman will come after him, let him deny themselves and take up his cross daily. That is the message that Jesus is saying to us to take his cross daily and to confess our sins and follow him. Now, there were also symbols in the skins that were used. These symbols in the skins, they also pointed to Jesus' ministry. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2 and 1, the beggar's skin that was used there, it represented Jesus' humility. Uh, the rams, there was a red dyed ram skin, which, re, which represented the stripes that Jesus um, was struck. By his stripes, we were healed. The God's hair, there was a God's hair which was woven there. Jesus being the perfect and the perfect sacrifice, he had many sins laid upon him. Again, there was the inner royal covering which meant that Jesus was the victim. Now he has become the great high priest. I'm, I'm sure you are 
I hope you are following. Now, we come to one of the most important parts. Now, what was the day of atonement? What was the day of atonement? So the day of atonement was a special occasion to make, apo- to make a- um, atonement for the holy sanctuary. So all year long, the sins of the people were symbolically what? Being transferred to the sanctuary by, through what? The blood of animals. So, so by means of the, of the blood, the sins of God's people, they contaminated the tabernacle. All year long, the sin-filled blood polluted the tabernacle. But on the day of atonement, these sins, they were cleansed out of the sanctuary. And on this day, two gods were used. One god was chosen for a special work. It was the first god which was offered as a sacrifice. And no sins were confessed on this god. And, and this god, when it was sacrificed, his blood was used for cleansing. When you read Leviticus chapter 16, it says, Then you shall kill the god of sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So only the, the high priest brought this blood into the most holy place. And, and, the, and the high priest would make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So what did the people do on the day of atonement? You find that on the day of atonement, when the high priest would be in the most holy place, the people would afflict their souls. They would, the whole time, they would confess their sins. They would be fasting and praying, making sure that they have confessed all of their sins. And the high priest would make atonement for them to be cleansed. As long as the high priest was still in the most holy place, there was a chance that as long as everyone was confessing their sins before the the high priest comes out, their sins, they were forgiven. And there was another God as well, which was called the God of Azazel, or the scapegoat. And this scapegoat, this scapegoat was the God where all, this, all the sins which were, which, were in the, which were in the sanctuary, they were symbolically transferred to the high priest. And when the high priest walks out of the sanctuary, those sins, they were symbolically transferred on this very same God. And that same God was what? It was sent away. That was called the scapegoat. And and we will see further as we go that this scapegoat, it represented the devil. So what, what, what is Jesus doing now since he has returned to heaven? Romans chapter 8, verse 34. It says that um, Jesus is making, is what? Romans chapter 8, I shall read that one. He says, it is Christ who died. Furthermore, he is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for us. First John chapter 2, verse 1, what, what does it say? It says, we have, a, what? we have got an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 What does it say? If you follow quickly, it says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always intercedes for them. And when you read um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, it says, with his own blood, Jesus entered the most holy place once and for all, and having obtained eternal Redemption. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, We have got a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, where are we in the scheme of things? The servant of the Lord in the book, True Revival, she says, We are in the great 
antitypical day of atonement where our sins are by confession and repentance go through before and to judgment. So what you have seen is, is, is that um, from the beginning, we, we, we saw that the sanctuary on earth is a type of the sanctuary which is in heaven. And at, at the moment when Jesus Christ, when he died, and the veil between the holy place and the most holy place was cut into two, all the sacrifices on earth, they what? They finished. And Christ, as we have seen in the verses, Christ went straight at the right hand of God. He went into what? Into the holy place, okay? When he went into the holy place, and that's when he started uh, um, doing um, the same work that the priests were doing. Now, <clears throat> what did it mean for the, what, what did it mean that the sanctuary was going to be cleansed? When you read um, Romans chapter 12, verse 14, we, we find that for God in heaven, a record is kept of every person's life. These records are what will be studied during the judgment. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good, whether evil. So these records of, of sins, they are chronicled everything that we have done, everything that man has done. When we ask for forgiveness, Jesus, who is now the high priest, he, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And though, though Jesus is delighted to, for, to forgive our sins, he has also the responsibility of getting rid of these sins. Let's again go back to the Day of Atonement. Remember, there were two gods which were involved in the Day of Atonement. The first god, as we said, was the sacrificial god, and this god represented Jesus. And the second god was the scapegoat, which would all the sins would be transferred on this god, and this god would claim all the sins because it symbolized the ultimate author of sin, who is Satan. So the wickedness of all the Israel's sin, they were symbolically trans transferred to, to the gods, and it was banished and let loose into the world, into the wilderness. Similarly, Satan will be banished during the millennium, just like the yearly day of atonement was to cleanse the earthly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary would also be cleansed. Now, when we go to Daniel chapter 8, um, just a few minutes, Daniel chapter 8, we are told that when is the heavenly sanctuary cleansed? Daniel chapter 8, we are told that unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So Daniel was shown the heavenly sanctuary in Daniel chapter 9. And he was shown its cleansing in a vision from God. And during this vision, he had an overview of future world events. And throughout the study of this prophecy, you will find that in Ezra chapter 7, the, um, uh, uh, um, from the commandments to restore Jerusalem, there was uh, up to the time when Christ entered into the most holy place, there was 2,300 days, which are, it, which, which are in, in, in prophecy 2,300 years. But we are not going to dwell much on this because of it needs time. But the point to take home is that the heavenly sanctuary, as we are confessing our sins, as Christ is representing us today, the heavenly sanctuary is contaminated with the records of sin. And Jesus, who has entered into the most holy place since that time, he, he is the one who began the process of cleansing the sanctuary. And his sinless life is enough to cover the sin of every person that has ever lived. Now, as we have mentioned uh, 
that the scapegoat was sent away. Just likewise, in the final cleansing of sin of the universe, there will be a final scapegoat with Satan who is going to bear the sins of the righteous. And when the sanctuary in heaven is cleansed, those sins will be transferred to Satan. So when does this, when does this ministry that Jesus is doing right now, when does it end? Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says, I am coming quickly. And he also says that there will be a time when you will say, he who, he, he, he who is unjust, let him be unjust. And that's when Christ would walk out of the most holy place and he would come straight away. The moment he walks out of the most holy place, that's when that scripture, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout. Right now, Jesus, he is lingering in the heavenly sanctuary. He is ready to offer, to, he is ready to forgive our sins as long as we are confessing them. He is ready to credit the price that he paid to our account. So Jesus today is our advocate. Jesus today is our intercessor. When you pray, just like as it was happening in the earthly sanctuary, Jesus today he is the one who intercedes for us to the Father. Jesus, again, is, is our ultimate sacrifice. And Jesus, again, being the one who, who became man, who, who, is well, who is well acquainted to all that we, 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 are, we are feeling. He is the perfect representative for us. He is our great high priest. Now, what does this mean? For us today, just like it is in the laundry system, when clothes, soiled clothes, they get inside, there is a, pro, there, there is a time when, when, when you put your clothes which are uh, dirty, and there will be a time when, when they are cleansed, when they are washed, they, what? they come out as well. So the sanctuary is God's laundry system where our garments are washed and they are made white in the blood of the lamp. In his plan, the washing and the ironing will finally result in one thing. It will result in a glorious church. It will result in a church having no spots. It, is, it will result in a church, in a people who will have no sin or any such thing. That is God's way. His way being in the what? In the sanctuary. So what we see is that the sanctuary message is all about Jesus. The sanctuary message is all about what Christ is doing. The, the sanctuary message is a message that shows us our way, the way of salvation. And today, as we are talking today, Jesus is in the most holy place. And, and any time, any time now, from the way things are happening, from the way the prophecies are being fulfilled, the probation might close any time because of the way the things are happening. And Christ is just waiting for you and I to, to, to bring ourselves to him, to confess our sins because he is our advocate, he's our lawyer today, and he's our great high priest. And his blood now, not the blood of animals which were used, because those, they were a shadow. But now he is, he, he, it, with his own blood, it is the one that um, he, he offers whenever we, what, we confess our sins. And our sins, they, 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 they will be, all be cleansed. And, and what he is looking for is, he is looking for a time, time when he would have communion with men, just like it was in the Garden of Eden, when men, had a relationship with God. When, when, when God he used to walk in the garden to have communion. And when Christ comes, there will be a great reunion. But, the, but this is a time and a chance for us when Christ is, in, is still in the, in the most holy place to, to, to cry for our sins, to, to look into our lives. Is there any spot in me? Christ is there for, for, for us as our mediator. And personally, 
I would want to be part of this group, which, which will be a church, a people who have no spots, a people who have no wrinkle or whatsoever, a thing. Um, I don't know if there's any one of you who desires to be amongst this group, a group where Jesus would find without sports. And the chance is, is now for us to take this opportunity when Christ is still in the most holy place. How many of us wants to say, I don't want to miss out on this group, which, which is going to be found as a glorious church, a church without sports? We can raise up your hands. Shall we, well, shall, shall we stand up as we pray?